Before we start the show today, I want to ask you a favor. Don't worry, it's easy. This week, I'd like you to tell one person, just one, about our show. If we can keep growing our audience, we'll be able to do bigger, more ambitious projects. So please text or email one friend about the show. It would mean a lot. Okay, on with the show. Some parts of this episode deal with suicide. Please use discretion when listening. The key thing is focusing on very specific problems and trying to understand the opportunity structure for them and then trying to change that opportunity structure. There's now you know, over 270 million personally owned firearms in the United States right now. It's more than the next five countries combined. Guns are five times as likely to kill. Owning a firearm dramatically increases the risk of death by suicide. These are not debatable points. This is reality. Welcome back to In Sickness and In Health, a podcast about health and social justice. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. This season, we're looking at gun violence in America. We're going to start today's show in Britain. Back in the 1950s, specifically the kitchen. This little lady's picnic dishes are guaranteed to make the most hardened gourmets mouth water. Ovens in England and Wales were heated with a gas made from coal. Your oven has been heating for the last 15 minutes, and if you put the baking sheet in the hottest part, the roll should be done in about 10 minutes. The gas having been turned fairly high. Any cooking gas is toxic, but this stuff was especially nasty. If you turned on the gas taps in the the oven and put your head inside, you could be dead really quite quickly, like within 20 minutes often. This is how Sylvia Plath famously ended her life. That old line about sticking your head in the oven, that's what this is about. Yes. Various people had observed uh, there was some kind of relationship between levels of suicide and the, and the toxic content of domestic gas pumped into people's homes. This is Ronald Clark. He's a professor at Rutgers University. Ronald and his colleague Pat Mayhew got curious about this supposed connection. So they decided to take a closer look, and they found that gas heating ovens were getting less toxic over time. The industry began to make gas from oil. It was cheaper to make the gas from oil. And the toxic content of that gas was considerably less than the gas uh, used previously. And then even later, after the uh, ovens and fires and all the rest of it in, in England and Wales were changed to accept uh, uh, natural gas, natural gas has no carbon monoxide, so it was carbon monoxide free and non-poisonous. As the toxicity of the gas dropped, so did another thing, suicides. What you see is corresponding declines, very clearly corresponding declines in the percentage of people in England and Wales who killed themselves with domestic gas. At the beginning of the period I studied, I think it was 1958, the first figures I looked at, uh, almost exactly 50% of people who killed themselves in the country used, uh, used domestic gas. By the end of the period I studied, uh, hardly anyone at all used gas. Seems obvious, right? The gas is less toxic. Fewer people use it to end their lives. But it goes farther than that. The interesting thing was that the overall suicide rate in England declined very considerably as well. In other words, people who had been formerly able to use gas then did not switch to other ways of killing themselves. Whatever the other uh, methods were, handguns, jumping off tall buildings, clambering onto railway tracks, trying to slit their wrists, taking pills, there was partial displacement to these other methods, but by no means complete. Most people didn't look for other ways to end their lives. They just kept living. Believe it or not, this research has a lot to say about gun violence. Like British oven gas in the 1950s, guns in the U.S. today are cheap 
easy to get a hold of, and extremely lethal. That goes for hurting someone else or yourself. In this episode, we're going to try to apply some of these same lessons to preventing gun-related deaths. How do access, opportunity, and lethality converge to make guns so deadly? In public health and criminology circles, we call this instrumentality. How good is a weapon as an instrument of killing? We'll start with something that seems pretty obvious. Guns are lethal. Please welcome the 45th president of the United States of America, Donald Trump. When Donald Trump spoke to the NRA in 2018, he talked about knives and stabbings in London. I recently read a story that in London, which has unbelievably tough gun laws, a once very prestigious hospital right in the middle is like a war zone for horrible stabbing wounds. Yes, that's right. They don't have guns. They have have knives, knives. and And instead, instead, there's there's blood blood all over the floors of this hospital. His position was pretty clear. Because England regulates guns more strictly, there are more knife attacks. And as a result, he says, people are less safe. They They say say it's it's as bad as as a a military military war zone hospital. hospital. Knives, knives, knives. This is a common argument from pro-gun advocates. Violent criminals, they say, are going to use any tool at their disposal to commit violence, because that's what criminals are programmed to do. The same goes for people contemplating suicide. People kill people, they'll say. But this misses the point of instrumentality. Guns are really good at killing people. Knives, less so. Guns are five times more likely to kill than a knife in an assault. This can have a big impact in how an argument ends. In England, there are more fights and assaults than in the U.S. Now that's because uh, of the pub culture in Britain. So a lot of assaults in Britain have to do with people who've been drinking in pubs. Now that culture isn't anywhere near as widespread in this country. So we have more assaults in Britain, but fewer homicides. Fewer homicides because the weapons on hand are a lot less lethal. If I quarrel with my neighbor in England, I can't go and fetch a gun and shoot him, um, which is quite possible in this country, and we know it happens. But I can't do it in England. I might, you know, hit him with my fists. Guns are very, very uh, lethal. And if you have them around, they're more likely to be used in in um, arguments. Just having a gun around can make people more aggressive. Minor arguments can turn deadly. This gets back to this idea of instrumentality. There's a strong belief generally in the population, and this is true in England as well, that the roots of evil lie within people. And it's true, but also Um, situations have a very large effect on outcomes such as homicide and and, um, suicide and accidents. Um, And they're reluctant, most people are reluctant to see that. They they think it's all to do with what's what's going on in in people's minds. It isn't just that. It's also the situations in which they are. Uh, And part of the situation is whether there's a weapon available or not. The huge number of guns in the U.S. ups the ante and makes our crime a lot more violent. We used to think that the problem was that we had more thieves than London or Berlin uh, or Rome. And that just wasn't true in terms of the risk to life that came from criminal violence was not because we had more criminals, but because the offenses committed and the mechanisms that were used were very different. This is Franklin Zimring. He's a law professor at the University of California, Berkeley. Franklin wrote a book back in the 1990s that took a novel look at crime, 
He argued that crime and violence weren't necessarily connected. Let's go back to the discussions that we were having in the United States, particularly at the beginning of the 1990s. This is the period of the 1994 federal crime legislation when half the states in the union passed three strikes laws. When this bill is law, three strikes and you're out will be the law of the land. They are not just gangs of kids anymore. They are often the kinds of kids that are called super predators. No conscience, no empathy. And the notion was the reason American rates of violence were so high was because we had lots more criminals than other countries. There were two things very much wrong with that analysis. One of them was that it assumed that the way in which you fight life-threatening violence was by locking up anybody that commits crimes, whether violent or not. A quick refresher on robbery versus burglary. Robbery is when one person tries to take something from another person one-on-one. -on -one. Burglary is when someone sneaks into your house and takes something when you're not there. Okay, back to Franklin. You lock up burglars because you're afraid uh, robbers will shoot and kill you. Robbers were in the early 1990s shooting and killing 1,500 or 1,800 Americans a year. But the problem is burglars weren't shooting and killing anybody. Franklin compared cases of robbery and burglary in London and New York City. London had a higher burglary rate than New York City. And that must have meant that it had more burglars. But it had a much smaller robbery rate and an infinitesimally smaller armed robbery rate. So that the number of killings from the combination of British property crime, robbery and burglary, was tiny in comparison to the American. So what's going on here? The robbers got to work through you. So you're there, and he has to have something credibly to threaten you. A gun or a knife. Why doesn't he, if you say, no, I'm sorry, I don't have any money? Or if you say, I'm not going to give you any money, uh, an intelligent armed robber would say, oh, the hell with you, and go on and rob somebody else. But that's not what happens. And something like one out of every hundred loaded gun robberies in the cities where we studied them, a killing takes place. And the reason that happens is interpersonal conflict. As we talked about in episode 13, guns can make people more aggressive. All of a sudden, if you're refusing to cooperate or otherwise frustrating the robber, even though you two have never met before, you're having an argument. And you're having an argument with a man with a loaded gun. Franklin's saying crime doesn't necessarily have to be violent. It's the circumstances of the crime that make it deadly. Gun availability, concealed gun availability, leads to a different mix between burglary and robbery. If you have a gun, robbery seems much easier, and larger gun availability leads to a larger rate of robbery instead of burglary. And you see, the difference is vast in terms of personal danger. The burglar wants to get to your house when you're not there. That makes it a wonderful way to lose a laptop, but not a threat to your life. You're left with a situation where the opportunity to threaten someone with a gun is greater in the U.S. because it's so easy to get a gun. And the very presence of a gun in a conflict means the chances of someone dying are much, much higher.
guns are, unsurprisingly, more deadly than knives or other weapons. But what would we find if we just focused on different kinds of guns? Much of the debate on TV news has been about assault rifles, high-capacity magazines, bump stocks, and the like. But what makes for the deadliest gun? It depends on how you look at it. Handguns were traditionally nine times as likely to be used in homicidal events as long guns. And why is that? Because you can conceal them in public. You can not, unless it's really raining hard and you're raining and you're wearing a raincoat, get a very deadly shotgun <laughs> or rifle uh, through a public sphere without announcing that there is a, a particular violence potential and encouraging countermeasures. And if it's visible, it can lead to control efforts and responses to the presence of a, a hazard which is known. But if you've got a pistol in your pocket, the element of surprise makes it very difficult to have an anticipatory response. You were saying handguns are so much more dangerous uh, than, say, rifles or shotguns because they can be concealed. So why is the focus so much on assault weapons and not handguns? Because mass shootings get our attention and aggregate statistics less so. Mass shootings are horrific. That's why they hold our attention. But when we take a step back, handguns are actually the most deadly weapon in the U.S., at least by the numbers. More people are killed every year with a handgun, more than shotguns, more than AR-15s, or any other long gun. When you go from mass shooting episode to mass shooting episode, you tend to be looking at different issues each time. The way the media covers mass shootings distracts from the bigger problem, the massive number of guns, especially handguns, in this country. Remember the story from the top of the show, the one about detoxifying oven gas in England? We can apply that same thinking to gun-related deaths, including suicides. It's called means safety. Means safety refers to taking a suicide method and making it less deadly or less available for a suicide attempt. And that can apply to firearms, but it can apply to any method. This is Mike Anestis. He's a professor at the University of Southern Mississippi. Mean safety is most effective when a method is highly lethal and it's highly uh, popular or frequently used in a specific area. In a sense, mean safety is about blunting the instrumentality of a weapon. Some classic examples of this were in the 1950s in the UK, by far the most common way to die by suicide were sticking someone's head in the, in the oven. The UK detoxified domestic gas. The suicide rate by sticking your head in the oven went down by 80 to 90 percent. The overall suicide rate went down by 40 percent. More recently in Sri Lanka, by far the most common suicide attempt method is pesticide. They simply banned some of the most lethal pesticides and the suicide rate in Sri Lanka went down by 50 percent. And then with firearms, the Israeli Defense Force uh, in the early part of the 2000s realized a lot of their young soldiers who were doing their compulsory military service were dying by shooting themselves on the weekend. This changed the policy and said, you know what, you can't bring your firearms home on the weekends or for holiday. And their suicide rate amongst those young soldiers went down by 40%. They didn't start dying on other days. They didn't start dying by other methods. They just stopped dying. There are some parallels here between crime and suicide. Do people kill people, or do guns kill people? Let's say you have a criminal disposition, or in the case of suicide, maybe you're depressed or have some other mental illness. One of the ways that we've tripped up a bit in the suicide prevention field is that we, we talk about suicide risk broadly, rather than looking at the difference between risk for thinking about suicide and risk for attempting or dying by suicide. So mental illness, for instance, tells us a lot about thoughts of suicide but almost nothing about suicidal behavior. 
and there's a huge study called the National Comorbidity Survey that had thousands of, of participants, and they, they had them fill out information about their suicidal history and their mental illness. There was no single mental illness, combination of mental illnesses, or number of mental illnesses that predicted suicidal behavior. Here's where gun ownership comes in. Gun ownership tells us almost nothing about who's suffering and who's thinking about suicide, because guns don't make you suicidal. But they tell us a lot about who's going to die. In other words, it isn't enough to be suicidal. You need a weapon. A weapon that's available, accessible, and lethal. That sounds a lot like a gun. The debate between mental health and gun safety is frustrating on multiple levels. It creates a false choice. When you work towards addressing firearms, it doesn't mean you're not working towards addressing mental health. And if you're working towards mental health, it doesn't mean you can't work towards addressing firearms. It's an easy way to, to sort of pivot away from the gun conversation um, and to try and paint folks like myself as having an agenda that we don't really have. The quickest, most powerful way would be if there were fewer firearms. Um, if, if we did not have a country inundated with firearms, our suicide rate would be substantially lower. You have to address the firearm. Franklin Zimring, too, worries that so long as guns, especially handguns, are widely available, it'll be hard to make a dent in the gun deaths in America. There really are a, a whole series of rather gentle controls that 80% of the population supports that when you add them all up would have a modest at best <laughs> reduction in the death rate attributable to the use of firearms and violence. That is to say, everything that we're willing to do, even if the NRA didn't exist, is at best a 10% reduction in additional death rate because of the instrumentality effect of all the guns that are out there that get used in interpersonal violence, and probably in suicide as well. Guns, especially handguns, are unique weapons. They're widely available, concealable, and lethal. The presence of a gun makes people more aggressive, raises the stakes, and inflames interpersonal conflicts. This is why guns are so deadly, and why it'll be so hard to curb gun-related deaths without addressing the factors that make them so dangerous in the first place like how easy it is to get one and how many there are. Then there are the things that could cut our homicide rate in half because of instrumentality effects. But those involve very substantial reductions in the availability of concealable firearms. Next episode, we'll look at a country that did just that, Australia. Australia shares a similar colonial history to our own, a foreign land invaded, a wild frontier tamed, and native peoples subjugated. Many still live in rural areas where guns come in handy for everyday work on a farm. They have a strong hunting and sports shooting culture. But first, a scene of horror and carnage in the Tasmanian town of Port Arthur tonight, where as many as 25 people have been shot dead in Australia's worst massacre. At least 15 people are wounded, and the gun And yet, still after the Port Arthur massacre in 1996, Australians came to see the need for gun regulation very differently. You'll hear the story next time on In Sickness and in Health. Today's episode of In Sickness and in Health was produced by Zach Dyer and me. Our theme music is by Alan Vest. Additional music by the Blue Dot Sessions. If you enjoy the show, please email or text a friend about it today. And if you haven't already done so, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps more people find out about the show. You can learn more about this podcast and how to engage with us on social media at insicknessandinhealthpodcast.com. That's insicknessandinhealthpodcast.com. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. This is In Sickness and in Health.